This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, fantastic. So thank you very much, Larry, for those kind words. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about the research that I've been doing for my thesis titled Elucidating the Genetic Control of Qualitative Traits in Hemp. So before I get into the research, I'd like to give a little bit of a background of what hemp is. So hemp is cannabis sativa, a species that it shares with the uh, currently federally illegal plant marijuana. But the difference between hemp and marijuana is the concentration of one chemical, and that is THC, which is psychoactive. Notably, hemp has less than 0.3% THC, while marijuana has greater than 0.3% THC. And this is a very important number, and I'll get back to it later on in the presentation. Hemp is usually dioecious, diploid, and short day, but there are some exceptions to this, and I'll talk about those later as well. And what's really interesting about hemp is that it's really a multi-purpose crop. There are a few major market classes that hemp can be grown for, the three most important of which are grain, fiber, and inflorescence. So at the moment, right now, the smallest market, both in terms of acreage and in terms of economic impact, and at least in the United States, is hemp for grain. Uh, that being said, I think that there's great opportunities for hemp as a grain crop. And for the people who are here, please help yourself to the snacks in the back, which I largely made using hemp hearts as pictured here. Uh, so these hemp hearts, which are the, uh, the seed once you remove the, the hard shell on the outside, uh, they've got a bit of a reputation as a superfood. They're relatively high in uh, oil with a three to one omega six to omega three fatty acid profile, which is largely uh, accepted to be optimal for human health. They're high in uh, highly digestible protein. And uh, today you can buy this grain hemp in many places, uh, either whole with that shell on, dehulled, as you can see in the back with these hearts, this picture up here. Uh, you can also either extract the oil from the whole seeds or the dehulled seeds, and uh, the remaining protein-rich cake can be further processed to create protein isolates. So the next largest major market class of hemp is for fiber, and the part of the plant that you grow hemp for for fiber is the stem. Uh, so what happens if you cut that stem right across, you would see two distinct parts of the stem. You'd see the outer bast fibers, which are strong, durable, and can be treated to make some uh, very nice textiles, like this tie that I'm wearing right here. Uh, the inside is a woody herd, and it can basically be used for anything that you could use wood for. So it's very commonly pulped um, or uh, chopped into small pieces for animal bedding. Uh, so what's great about the hemp is that uh, it can be grown all over. It's widely adapted to very different regions, and you can get potentially very high yields. This is a field that we grew last year, and some of these plants were 16 feet tall, and we were getting upwards of 20 megagrams per hectare of dry redded fiber from these plants. Uh, in fact, uh, the biomass of these plants is so prodigious, uh, it's at least comparable to the, uh, the best willow lines that we have been uh, testing as the other part of Larry's program. So the last major market class for hemp, which is by far and away the most profitable right now, but it has been shrinking greatly since 2019, is inflorescence hemp. So inflorescence hemp is usually grown for the cannabinoids and the, the terpenes, uh, which reach their highest concentration in unpollinated female inflorescences. So while the other two major market classes, grain and fiber, are mostly grown as a row crop, the inflorescence hemp is much more horticultural. We'll grow them on a plant by plant basis. We'll go through extraordinary lengths to make sure that there's no pollination and no males in the field. And um, we'll, yeah, we'll put a lot more effort into growing these plants. Uh, so it's a very interesting market in that right now there seems to be a, uh, a split in what people grow inflorescence hemp for. Um, on the one hand, there's the smokable flower. And then on the other hand, it is the, uh, the extract of this uh, high CBD with the terpenes. And uh, these are forming very different market classes and we're, we're seeing it evolve in real time. So for my thesis, what I really wanted to address were some of the major problems that were facing hemp. So hemp is a very new crop. It was first able to be grown in the US um, with a research license in the 2014 Farm Bill. So there's a lot of new challenges that face this crop. 
And uh, there was an interesting study published by Shelby Ellison from University of Wisconsin-Madison who did a poll of uh, stakeholders in the hemp business. And far and away, the most important aspect for hemp was that of regulatory research. So the major plant here was that the plants that were being grown produced too much THC. So the big question was, what makes these plants produce too much THC? Because we don't want to plant a hemp field and have it actually be marijuana. Other major problems that I felt that I could address with my thesis were a lack of adapted cultivars and a lack of stable cultivars. And a major thing that motivated a lot of my research was the development of molecular markers, which could aid in developing adapted and stable cultivars. So the big problem, hemp going hot. So hemp producing more than 0.3% THC. So we really want to figure out how can we stay below that threshold. So in plant breeding, we generally like to partition things into genetic causes, environmental causes, or the interaction between the two. So this is sort of a nature versus nurture idea. And if we look at what was commonly believed as recently as a few years ago, the big thing that caused hemp to go hot would be stress. So if we uh, look at this here, uh, the, these top two are hemp sites, uh, which very clearly state growers need to be aware that plant stresses can result in THC spikes or any plant stress can tip it over the 0.3% THC and the whole crop is mowed down. And uh, even if we look at, for instance, cooperative extension sites in 2018, we have here the main things that can cause THC spikes are stressors. And there was even actually an article in the New York Times about a quirk in the chemistry of hemp plants that can cause them to overproduce THC when stressed. So coming into it, it seemed like everybody thought it was the environment. So overall, we wanted to address this. We started addressing this in 2018 with our cultivar trials. And I have here the CBD and THC levels of a few different cultivars, grain cultivars in blue, uh, fiber cultivars in orange, dual purpose grain and fiber cultivars in gray, and then our CBD cultivars in teal over there. And what you can see is that some of these grain cultivars produce mostly CBD, but a very small amount and a much smaller amount of THC. But some of those cultivars grown under the same conditions, the same stressors, they produce way more THC, well over that threshold. And you see that same genetic difference looking at these different cultivars, grain, fiber, and dual purpose. And uh, when we look at the CBD production, things get a little bit stranger. Uh, so with these CBD cultivars, we measured things on a per plant basis as opposed to a per plot basis like we did with the other ones. And uh, when we average it out by cultivar, you can see here it's just kind of wild. But one important thing to note is that everything we tested was considerably above that 0.3% THC threshold. So one of the things that we did, because we had this per plant basis of cannabinoids, we plotted the CBD against the THC. And rather remarkably, we see three distinct groups when we look at this per plant CBD to THC ratio. We have that one group at the top that's almost entirely THC and very close to zero CBD. We have about equal CBD and THC. And then we have that group at the bottom, which is uh, mostly CBD. Uh, if I can just give, uh, there we go. So we aren't actually the first ones to see this phenomenon. This has been uh, the subject of a lot of research from many different groups. And what has been uh, found out is that whether a plant produces majority CBD, majority THC, or about equal of both can really be attributed to one single locus, which is called the B locus. So when you get into the, the nitty gritty molecular genetics, it's kind of a mess, but from a plant breeding perspective, it doesn't really matter. All that really matters is that we have a BD allele, which has an active CBDA synthase and no active THCA synthase. We have a BT allele, which has active THCA synthase and no active CBDA synthase. And because hemp is usually diploid, you can have a heterozygous case. So it has active copies of both. And this maps on exactly to what we saw. We have chemotype one plants, which are almost entirely THC, chemotype two, which are about equal. They tend to skew a little towards CBD. And then chemotype three, which are majority CBD. So one of the first things I did when I started working here was develop molecular markers, which could distinguish these loci. And when I applied that to my 
uh, CBD trials on the per plant basis, I saw perfect segregation into these three distinct groups, which map onto these chemotypes that have been previously described. Uh, what's really notable though, is that if we look at these blue dots here, which are those chemotype three plants, the ones that don't have an active THCA synthase, even uh, when, you, when you go above around 7% total potential CBD, you get above 0.3% THC. So it doesn't appear that simply being chemotype three is enough to keep you under that total potential THC. So given my last slide, I think it's pretty clear that genetics has a very strong role in determining if THC goes high. So we have a, a theory that in the past people were sampling a stressed plant that happened to be chemotype one or two, and then they saw that it had extreme amounts of THC and then they blamed the stress rather than the genetics. So even given all that, it's still possible that there was an environmental effect either on total THC or on that ratio of CBD to THC. In our previous trials, we weren't actively trying to kill the plants. So it's hard to you know, really say that we were um, stressing them out. Uh, so we stressed them out and tried to kill them. Uh, we did one site with three distinct chemotype three cultivars in a split pot design. And we applied a few different stresses to these plants. We had a control plot. We sprayed some with ethophon. We sprayed some with herbicide. And that's what's pictured here. And that plant was very stressed. It was, it was pretty nearly dead there. We also infected some plants with powdery mildew with the idea that maybe cannabinoids are for pathogen resistance, so they'd be upregulated. Uh, we also went at them with a weed whacker and we also flooded a uh, pot as well. So remarkably, nothing increased THC over control. So not only does stress, you know, not, it, it's not just that genetics has a large effect, it appears to be the only thing that matters here. So if we look at this total THC, nothing was above our control for total THC, but our herbicide treated plants were considerably below that total THC. And that makes a lot of sense because those plants were very nearly dead. And as we're fond of saying in the lab, a dead plant produces no cannabinoids. But if we look at that ratio of CBD to THC across all cultivars, across all environments, it's flat across the board um, somewhere between 20 and 30. So there's no change in CBD to THC ratio upon any environmental stress that we tried. So an obvious question is, why is this ratio so consistent? And to answer this, we think the answer comes from a, a paper that was published in 2018 from a group in Germany, where they took the CBDA synthase enzyme, that one that makes the CBD, and they expressed it in yeast, and what they found was that for every 100 molecules of CBD that this enzyme produced, it also produced about four molecules of THC. And remarkably, that's exactly what we see in the plants. So we have strong reason to believe that it's just this product promiscuity. It's this one enzyme that's making this THC as well as the CBD. Now what's more, if this model were correct, it makes an interesting prediction in that while this um, enzyme made 100 molecules of CBD and about four of THC. It also made about six of another cannabinoid called CBC. So we went back to our cannabinoid trials and lo and behold, that's the ratio that we saw in the vast majority of plants for CBC to CBD. So we have strong evidence that it's product promiscuity of the single enzyme that is causing the vast majority of these cannabinoids in the plant because the CBD to THC to CBC ratio in most plants matches the enzyme exactly. Now there are a few outliers in terms of CBC production. Some of them have abnormally high CBC production and other groups have found dedicated CBC asynthases, but in most of the plants that we've tested, that's not the case. And this cannabinoid profile can be explained by this single enzyme. So with all of this, we have some very concrete advice to growers. We suggest to them to grow chemotype three plants. Don't grow chemotype one and two plants if you want to stay below 0.3 because you won't be able to. And we also suggest them to uh, test the plants early and to not get greedy because it looks like because that ratio is set at around 7%, it's going to produce 0.3% THC. So if we have to stay under 0.3% THC, we have to stay under 7%. CBD. Now, as I mentioned earlier, one of the first things I did was create molecular markers. And 
Um, next up, I'm gonna talk about how I applied these in a breeding context. So we've tested a lot of different cultivars and a lot of cultivars are segregating for this D locus. Um, in, in fact, I didn't mention it earlier, but in our CBD trial, I had 13 cultivars and 12 of them had active THC synthase. They had that BT allele. So we came across a couple of interesting cultivars from China, um, this one Puma and this other one Han Northwest. And when we um, applied our molecular markers to these, uh, we saw that there was a uh, uh, about a 25% of the plants were chemotype one, about 25% were chemotype three, and then about half were chemotype two. So this is exactly what you'd expect to see for a population in Hardy-Weinberg's equilibrium with an allele frequency of about 0.25, or sorry, about, about 0.5. Um, but in any case, what we wanted to do was simply select the chemotype three plants out of this. And we can do that with the molecular marker, which is a much easier thing to do than to select based on HPLC analysis. So I uh, have made progress in both of these projects, but unfortunately, due to some vagarities in the weather, I don't have much data to present on Puma, but I do have some interesting data on this Han Northwest population. So if we look at the original ratio of the CBD to THC of Han Northwest, it's around 0 0.7, so it's pretty low. And when you look at that total THC, it's up pretty high, well above that 0.3 threshold. When I selected my plants and then did two further cycles of phenotypic selection based on earliness, we can see that CBD to THC ratio goes well up above 20. And we look at the total THC, which is the number that matters, we're very low at around 0 0.06. So this one round of marker selection was very effective in removing that active THC synthase enzyme and reducing the total THC in the plant. Now, last year we had our first yield trial of this cultivar. And before I get into how well it uh, yielded, I wanna talk a little bit about how hemp generally yields. Uh, so in 2021, it was the first year that the USDA released estimates on hemp yields in pounds per acre. And it's pretty low, 530 is not that great even compared to other specialty crops. And this is largely because of a lack of adapted cultivars. A lot of the grain cultivars were bred um, in Canada or in Finland. So they're not gonna grow all that well in New York, much less in Florida or Texas. Uh, so this 530 matches pretty well with our experience. Uh, this is 2020 yield data. And we can see that uh, most of the cultivars that we tried were around 500 to 1000 pounds per acre. Um, our best ever trial cultivar was a little bit above 2000 pounds per acre, but we haven't really been able to replicate that. And the best, hemp yield I've ever seen in the literature, and I haven't really been able to track down exactly how it was done, but they're reporting yields of up to 3,000 pounds per acre. So if we could get up to 3,000 pounds per acre regularly, uh, hemp could be a competitor to soybean. So we were, were really excited. And uh, you know, when I started, that was the big dream. Maybe we can have the next soybean if we can get this 3,000 pounds per acre um, as a regular thing. So in 2021, we tried this new cultivar and most of the old cultivars that we tried were again around that 500 to 1000 range. But this new cultivar here yielded above 4000 and was in fact pushing 5000 pounds per acre. So I'm sort of tempted just to stop there and claim that I 10 x the uh, hemp yield from 500 to 5000. Uh, but there are a couple of big caveats there. Uh, so first of all, even though I did a couple of rounds of selection for earliness, um, this plant was still very, very late. We were harvesting around October 15th. And in Ithaca, the last day of frost is usually accepted to be about October 1st. So um, we don't really wanna advise growing plants that are gonna mature after frost. Uh, the other major thing, which um, would, would, is a big asterisk on this number is that these plants in the field were giants, they were 10 feet tall easily. And uh, that meant that our regular combine couldn't harvest them. So we had to harvest them by hand. And it's, it's pretty well known and not talked about much that uh, when you harvest a plant by combine, you end up losing about 30% of the total yield. So these, these ones here are, are regular cultivars. They're artificially depressed in that we lost a lot in the combining process that we didn't lose in this new cultivar that we developed. Um, so with all that being said, we think that there are answers to these problems with advancements in machinery and uh, perhaps to deal with the, the lateness problem growing it at a more southern uh, latitude. And we have um, collaborated with 
uh, various people from NC State, from Kentucky, uh, from Florida, and from uh, Arizona, who will be trialing this cultivar next year to see what kind of yields they can get off of it, and if the plant will remain manageable enough that it can be harvested using conventional means. Uh, so um, I think I've demonstrated that these molecular markers have been very effective in developing new cultivars, uh, but they also led to some interesting scientific advances. Uh, so this is the chromatogram that I get when I run my molecular marker. These are chemotype one plants, these are chemotype two plants, and these are chemotype three plants. And this is my, uh, my water control. So there, there's no amplification. Um, and uh, yeah, th there's no, no product present. So when I was running this on a wide variety of different cultivars, one of the cultivars consistently tested with my water control. So there was no amplification going there. And what was remarkable about that is that that cultivar was Santhica, which is not chemotype one, two, or three, but rather chemotype four, which is CDG dominant. And why that makes a lot of sense I'll, I'll discuss, but we'll have to get into the, the biochemistry a little bit here. So this is how cannabinoids get synthesized. The first cannabinoid that gets synthesized is CBGA. If CBDA it, synthase is present, the CBGA gets converted into CBD, and then um, upon application of heat, it can be decarboxylated into CBD, which is the active compound when THCA synthase is present, it gets converted into THCA and then THC. And what you can imagine would be some block here that might be an inactivated CBDA synthase or an inactivated THCA synthase, or maybe it lacks those cannabinoid synthase genes altogether. So with a combination of sequencing, molecular marker work, and looking at breeding histories, we found that there were four distinct routes to CBG dominance. So that Santhika plant that I was showing you earlier, it didn't amplify because it was missing that locus. We also found another one with a mixing locus called Panakea, and it has a very distinct breeding history, so we don't think it's the same knockout. We found one type of inactivated CBD synthase, so it had that gene and it was um, expressed, but expressed much lower, um, but it was inactivated. We have an inactivated THC synthase, which is actually highly expressed, but it doesn't seem to produce THC. And we're currently in the process of uh, ensuring that these are in fact completely recessive and uh, developing molecular markers for all of these different groups. So the most common type of CBG plant we saw had this inactivated THCA synthase. And uh, what we did in 2020 was a CBG trial of high CBG plants. And there was a lot of segregation in this trial. Uh, so CBG was sort of the new cannab cannabinoid on the block. So everybody was uh, breeding for it very quickly and they didn't maybe do all of that great of a job making sure that their resultant cultivars were uh, uniform, distinct, and stable. So we saw a lot of segregation in the CBD trial. We saw segregation for chemotype. So not all of the plants that were given to us as CBG dominant were in fact CBG dominant. We saw some segregation between and within cultivars for powdery mildew resistance. Uh, quite remarkably, we saw some segregation for flowering time. Uh, so in a few of the cultivars, we had one quarter of the plants look like this and three quarters of the plants look like that. And you know, if I was growing that, I'd sure hate that because I put a lot of work into putting that. But as a geneticist, I love it when things happen at one quarter at a time. <laughs> uh, so before I get on to the work that I've been doing with flowering time, I would like to uh, summarize the work I've been doing with cannabinoids. So we've seen that many cultivars, including high CBD cultivars and grain and fiber cultivars are segregating for chemotype. And chemotype three plants, the ones with that active CBDA synthase, will produce 0.3% THC at around seven or 8% CBD and we think that that is because of promiscuous activity of the enzyme itself. We found that contrary to popular belief, stress does not have a major impact on cannabinoid profiles, found several different types of CBD dominant plants and used molecular markers for chemotype to breed new cultivars with very high yields. So getting into flowering time, flowering time is gonna be very important for pretty well any uh, major market class of hemp that we were going to grow. Uh, the great yield that I saw was because the plant was so late, um, I showed you earlier in the CBG trials, we had cultivars which are segregating with one quarter for that day neutral, very tiny phenotype. And uh, the, we've been tracking flowering time in CBD trials for a few years now. And uh, this is a paper published in 2021 with uh, George Stack as a first author, um, where we saw distinct flowering times within and across different CBD cultivars. 
Uh, so the most obvious difference here is this autoflower phenotype. So autoflowers um, are the term that's used in the cannabis community to refer to day length neutral plants. Uh, they have only a few weeks from seed to flower. So uh, they're not so great when you're planting them out at six feet spacing, but you can imagine some production systems where you have them really close and you can do several cycles a year. Uh, it's commonly believed to be a recessive gene, but there's actually been very little published research about this. So we wanted to map this gene and develop molecular markers for this autoflower trait. So to do this, I took two populations. One was in fact, one of those CBG populations that I was talking about earlier that was segregating one quarter. And I also made my own F2 population from a cross between an autoflowering plant and a full season plant. And in both, I saw one quarter of the plants flowering under long days in a greenhouse. So then I used a technique called bulk segregant analysis. Um, so basically what I did was I pooled the DNA from the autoflowering plants and I pooled DNA from the non autoflowering plants. And then I used a technique called PI BSA seq to figure out where those two groups were different. And what I found was that there was one nice, strong, statistically significant peak on chromosome one. So the autoflower trait is located on chromosome one. And within this peak, there were a few different candidate genes. And I was able to develop molecular markers, which could distinguish all of our different autoflowering cultivars, as well as our different segregating populations. So to further look at the effect of this autoflower in the uh, heterozygous case, I grew at a population last year in the field to, and genotyped it with these molecular markers that I developed. So what I found was that it was not in fact fully recessive. I found that the heterozygous case was a little bit earlier than the full season. Here I have it demonstrated as about being two weeks earlier and the plants were also shorter and had less biomass and um, some statistical modeling suggests that it is simply because these plants are earlier um, that they don't grow as tall and they don't grow as big. So if we look back at this original uh, flowering time data, we see that this one locus model with this autoflower one actually explains most of this variation here. We have our autoflowers, we have our heterozygotes, and we have our full seasons. When we look at these two cultivars here, Umpqua and Deschutes, we can see nice segregation of one-to-one -one early to late, which again, I'd hate as a producer, but as a geneticist. Um, what's more, they're marketed as F1s, so this is very likely just a simple back cross. And to give you an idea of what that looks like in the field, both of these were from the same seed lot, and you can see this plant here is nearly ready to harvest, and this one hasn't started flowering at all. So I used a very similar approach to map the difference between these two by bulking the early and the late plants, and found that there was a nice peak on chromosome one again, but it was distinct from this autoflower one locus being a little further in. And I've named this locus early one. Uh, looking at the sequencing data, that early group was heterozygous, and I was able to develop high throughput molecular markers which could distinguish the groups. And I'm uh, currently in the process of uh, testing uh, for epistasis between early one and autoflower one. So if we look back at this data here, we have a two locus model, which is explaining the variation we see. We have our autoflowers, our autoflower heterozygotes with early one uh, heterozygotes and uh, lacking that, and we have our full season. So there's still a fair bit of work to do here, especially to see the effects of this early one locus. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to have that in the field this year. Uh, we're also very curious about this one cultivar called late Sioux, which was very, very, very late flowering. And we think that it might have some potential for growth in more Southern um, latitudes, such as Florida, or even tropical locations, such as Thailand. One other thing that I had been working on concerning flowering time was to look at what cultivars would flower under 24 hour light. So you can consider these to be true day neutral and that they will flower even when there's no night at all. So I planted out a wide variety of populations that were distinct taxonomically. I found that the heterozygotes of autoflowers did not flower, which was what we expected. I saw that neither the early nor the late umquas flowered. But one thing that did flower that was a little surprising was some grain varieties from Canada. And when I tested them with my marker, they tested negative. Uh, so it's possible that my, it's the same gene, but my marker doesn't work on these populations. But it's also possible that there is some other gene, some other something going on, which is causing these plants to be able to flower under 24 hour light. And we've done some initial complementation 
assays to see which hypothesis is correct. And right now we're, we're leaning towards the fact that there may be several different genes conferring photoperiod insensitivity in hemp. So before I get on to my last major segment, I wanted to go over some highlights for flowering time. So I identified two distinct flowering time loci on chromosome one, and I developed high throughput molecular markers for these loci. I found that autoflower one heterozygotes were earlier and smaller than the full season plants. And I posited that there may be several different day neutrality photoperiod insensitivity genes present, um, but there's still a lot of work to be done to identify and map these genes. So the last thing that I wanna talk about is sex determination in cannabis. So as I mentioned earlier, cannabis is mostly dioecious. So there are separate male and female plants and uh, that's largely determined by um, um, an XXXY system. So female plants have two X chromosomes, male plants have an X and a Y chromosome. And uh, one of the things that I've done is develop a molecular marker that can distinguish between the X and Y chromosome. So we can see here, we get two nice groups. These are XY, these are XX. And uh, this is all that we see under normal populations. We don't see any YYs. Uh, so despite having a, a well-defined Y chromosome, uh, sex determination in cannabis is pretty labile. Uh, there are a fair number of plants that have two X chromosomes, but will produce male flowers. We call these monoecious, and they've found a, a lot of uh, uses in, um, in uh, grain and fiber production. Um, we also know that certain chemicals when sprayed on hemp will change the sex of that plant. For instance, if you spray silver thiosulfate on an XX female plant, it'll produce male flowers. And if you spray ethophon on an XY male plant, it'll produce female flowers and those female flowers can produce seed. Uh, so this STS treatment of, uh, on, on XX females to produce male flowers is widely used in the high cannabinoid industry because uh, the pollen resulting from that XX plant is going to be entirely X. So there's no Y chromosome floating around. So at least most of your uh, plants are going to be female. Uh, but this ethophon treatment for this XY male to female is less done. Um, and a large part of that is because there's not a huge market for, um, for a, a population that might be majority male. Uh, one thing that we were very curious about though, was if we could create a super male plant. So, so in theory, uh, if we take our XY plant, which is normally male and we spray ethophon on it, so it gets converted into a female, it'll produce seed. Uh, if you cross those, you would expect to see 25% XX female, 50% XY male, and potentially 25% YY super male, uh, which is a plant which produces only male offspring. So if you had a YY plant, crossed it with an XX plant, you would get 100% XY plants. And this could potentially be valuable in a fiber cultivar in that male plants tend to flower sooner and produce higher quality fiber, uh, but their existence was um, still a mystery. So we tried this out and we found that there were no YY super males observed either in germinated plants or simply in the seeds um, that we were able to obtain from these XY plants. What's very interesting though, is that instead of the two to one segregation that we might expect, if it was simply the case that YYs weren't viable, we saw a one to one segregation from male to female in the offspring. So we're still scratching our heads about this a little bit, but we think, but what we think might be going on is that there might be some gametophytic selection, maybe something in the case of during egg or ovule development, there might be some expression from the X chromosome, which is required. Um, so ultimately what we'd really like to do is pollinate an XY female with an XX male, um, but we haven't done that just yet, but that would uh, provide evidence one way or the other about whether the uh, Y chromosome at the egg stage results in a viable um, plant. So overall, to briefly summarize everything that I've been talking about so far, concerning cannabinoid synthases, we found that it's the cannabinoid chemotype, not the environment that causes THC to spike. We've seen that chemotype three plants produce about 0.3% THC at around 7% CBD. And we have good reason to believe that that's due to 
product promiscuity of the CBDA synthase enzyme. We found multiple kinds of CBG dominance, and we used molecular markers based on these uh, chemotypes to uh, breed high yielding grain and fiber cultivars. Concerning flowering time, I mapped two distinct loci to chromosome one, and I'm calling them auto flower one and early one. And I've posited there are likely additional photoperiod and sensitivity genes in uh, cannabis germplasm. In sex determination, I've developed a molecular marker for the Y chromosome and found that YY super males are unlikely to be viable. And this is potentially a result of gametophytic selection. So before I answer questions, I'd like to make some acknowledgments, especially to other people in Larry Smart's lab, notably uh, George Stack and Craig Carlson. I also like to make a special shout out to Mike Quaid, who did a lot of the screening work that I was talking about earlier. I'd also like to thank Louise for helping set up the snacks in the back. I'd like to thank Jamie Crawford from the Moore Lab, formerly of the Vians Lab, who has been a very valuable contact in Ithaca running the yield trials. I'd like to thank Chris Smart and Ali Kalla for their help with pathology, Joss Robe for all of the thousands of HPLC samples that we've gone through, and my committee members for their support. So this work was funded through three sources, including Pixis International and New York State Ag and Markets, as well as a new uh, FFAR Hemp Research Consortium. And uh, before I go to questions, I'd like to make one last uh, thank you to all the companies and individuals who generously provided the seeds which made this work possible. So I'll happily take any questions. Uh, I have a lot of questions about the yield. <laughs> <laughs> Be being a corn guy who likes to defend corn yield and C4 grasses. Um, so, so how much when you're measuring yield on that is that dry uh grain and what percent moisture are you at uh, on that yeah so we we so what right so how do we measure grain yield and this is really jamie crawford's wheelhouse but we do dry them to a standard percentage and i think the percentage is about six percent moisture eight percent moisture okay. yeah and, and i guess you know in order to if you were to support four ton per hectare uh, protein uh, coming off, you know, and you have a very high level of protein, right? That's going to... Uh... I have a slide prepared. <laughs> so this new cultivar here, a couple of things differentiate it from other cultivars. It, uh, it has very large seeds. It has about a 24,000 seed weight as opposed to the 13 that we normally see. It has very high oil concentration, but very low protein concentration. And uh, we've actually been doing some work with uh, the food science lab and found that this protein that's being isolated from this plant, uh, while there's less of it on a per seed basis, it appears to be more functional. So we've been looking at the different types of proteins that the plant expresses. There are three main types, adestins, vichillins, and albumins. And this cultivar that we've developed here has a very high albumin to adestin ratio, and that leads it to having superior solubility and functional properties. Well, I mean, I, I, okay, so, but my issue is at four tons per hectare of high protein without being a, a nitrogen fixing legume, this is going to require a heck of a lot of fertilizer. Is that correct? Does it take a lot of fertilizer? Yes. Yeah. So, so essentially that may become an, actually an environmental mess. I have another slide. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, right now, <laughs> this has been criminally understudied. But we think that hemp has a lot of potential as a um, as an as a alternate crop in regenerative agriculture. <laughs> in regenerative agriculture. So there hasn't been much study on this. Um, one interesting study out of Europe found that compared to wheat on wheat, wheat on hemp increased wheat yield by forty seven percent, which is quite remarkable. We've heard anecdotal increases of twenty five percent in onion or hemp or onion on hemp. Uh, this picture here, we have, uh, it wasn't a controlled experiment by any means, and it was much more dramatic in person, but we seeded some sorghum Sudan grass over our hemp fields, and just sort of looking at this, uh, we can see that where the hemp was growing, the sorghum Sudan grass had nearly twice the growth rate. So we think that there's a lot of potential for hemp to be used in a system like this. Uh, it's also flowers quite late in the season, which might be good for um, a late season bee food. Um, as for environmentally, whether it's um, all that beneficial if we need to apply that nitrogen to get these high protein seeds, that's an interesting concept. And I'd, I'd like to talk with you later on that if you're uh, free. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I'm concerned that the amount of nitrate release, nitrous oxide release to sustain that on a non legume would be massive. Okay, because that's it's an impressive level of protein, but that's a, a lot of nitrogen. Yeah, so, that's my concern. so it's a lot of nitrogen for sure. Um, so we don't know why we're getting better yields after this. It could be something like biological nitrification inhibition, which is leading to more of that nitrogen being retained, but we don't know. So do you think the 7% CBD is the limit or do you think there's a way you can further improve that while still staying below the point three? So is 7% CBD the limit or is there something we can do around it? So it feels a little dirty doing this, but what you can do legally is you can get your plant tested 30 days before you harvest. So you get it tested at 7%, wait 30 days and harvest it. And it's above 0.3, but it doesn't matter because it's not the legally binding um, number there. Um, we've also seen a little bit of genotypic variation. Um, some are sort of low 20s for that ratio, some are high 20s. Um, I don't think we've seen anything that's reliably over 30 to one. Um, but besides testing and growing those cultivars, um, you know, we've tested a lot of different things that might require some uh, biotechnological innovation. Um, yeah. Question? So, yeah, just following up on that, what, what is, the, what is uh, the, the, what is the term you use for this where, it, you know, it converts to THC? To Product promiscuity? Yes. What, 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 what is that like on a protein level? Is that when like the protein changes and like, 3% of the time it just produces something else? Yeah, so the, the question would be, um, how does product promiscuity happen? Yeah. And I wish I knew. I had a lot of plans to go in the lab and figure that out myself, but I was unfortunately uh, not allowed in the lab for a good portion of the past four years. Uh, so what probably happens is that you get, um, you know, it's an abstraction of a hydrogen or something, and then uh, it gets probabilistic about whether it's going to conform one way or the other. The actual, um, the molecule, the CBGA is probably, it's probably probabilistic whether it goes one way or the other. It's, it's probably what's going on, but more research is going to be required to really figure that out. And going back to the other question, um, if we could engineer that protein such that it didn't, that would be a, a very valuable thing, I think. Question in the back? Um, I have a question concerning the chemotype two and three, because it seems like you still see um, like a very wide range of CBD accumulation, um, almost like a quantitative the increase. Do you know what like the genetic regulation for that is? Is there is it just due to the um, inactivations in the B locus, or do you think there might be mutations in the promoter regions, or like do you know what on a genetic basis leads to this increase? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, so that because you do oh, oh. see this like um, almost quantitative increase in the CBD for the chemotype two and three. Total cannabinoid accumulation is a quantitative curve. So what's the genetic basis for the quantitative yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. accumulation of total cannabinoids? Uh, yeah, so looking at this here, um, yeah, cannabinoid synthesis, it's a complex trait about how much cannabinoids will be synthesized. This chemotype system doesn't tell you anything about that. It just tells you what group you're going to be in. Does that answer your question? Um, do, you, um, probably, do you know what leads to this, like the variation that you see within each chemotype? Um, I mean, there's going to be a lot of different. So what leads to variation within chemotype? So, um, so like within this group here, um, the variation, whether a plant's gonna be 4% or 12% is gonna be dependent on a lot of factors. Uh, like there's gonna be, you know, 10, 20, 100 genes, which are all gonna contribute a little bit to how much total cannabinoids the plant is gonna produce. Uh, when we look at this chemotype two plants, it gets a little more interesting because we see a lot more spread across here. It's not that 26 to one ratio that we see all the time in these other plants. And there's a couple of things which we think are involved there. Um, one of the cases is because this is heterozygous, um, you can sort of see some variation that's hidden in the homozygous case. So uh, we don't have a lot of data on this. And because all of these plants test way above 0.3% THC, we can't do any of that research here. 
uh, but some THCA synthases are more active than others. So when you're in a heterozygous case, you might be you know, here instead of here. Uh, but when you're in the homozygous case, you don't see it. Not sure how we figured that out since we can't work on those points. Ah, uh, yep. <laughs> Can you talk about how you did your complementation test? Can I talk about the complementation test? Uh, yeah, so I do have a slide for that at the end as well. And unfortunately, it doesn't really give a nice clean story. Um, so I have my Canadian grain variety here, which is Piccolo. And I found that it flowered under 24 hour light. I have my auto flower one plant here, which flowered under 24 hour light. And I have my F1 plant here, which was a cross between this grain variety and this auto flowering variety. Uh, so if there were two different recessive genes involved, you would see complementation between the two. So we would see that full pathway that leads to photoperiod sensitive flowering occur. But what we see here is that our grain flowers at around seven weeks, our auto flowers flower at four weeks, and the F1s flower at around seven weeks. Uh, so there might be some dominant thing coming from that grain variety, or there might be some interaction between whatever is going on for photoperiod insensitivity from the grain variety and the auto flower one. Um, one other interesting note is that we have distinct flowering times for male flowering from Piccolo, which is the grain variety, and this F1, with this F1 being quite a bit later in terms of male flowering. So in all, I don't have a clean story, but we're doing more work right now to really figure out what's going on in terms of photoperiod insensitive flowering. Okay, cool. Um, so for the con so CBDA and THCA are both converted to CBD and THC via heat, as you said. Does the does heat potentially, or can you have a potential effect right through the environment through this heat conversion? Or does potentially heat have an effect on the promiscuity of the enzyme? So what's the effect of heat given that it appears it decarboxylates all of these different chemicals? So that's a very interesting question, whether promis product promiscuity changes in heat. I would just guess, given my biochemistry background, that it might. You know, maybe there's more motion. Maybe that active site gets opened up a little bit, so it changes. But I don't have any hard and fast evidence right there. And uh, we haven't done very many heat trials, um, partly because they're they're very difficult to to run. You can't really run them outside, and our our greenhouse, you, you know, even that's a very difficult trial to run. Um, so the decarboxylation definitely occurs. Um, so all of the numbers that I've been presenting have been total potential cannabinoids. So that would be the amount of CBD if I converted all that CBDA to CBD. Um, we've just found that's a much more consistent number than looking either at the acid or at the neutral form. Uh, so heat does have effects on cannabinoid profiles, um, but those are some hard studies to run that we haven't done any work on. One question here, and then maybe we can look at Zoom. Yep. Um, I so I think when uh, the hemp started coming around, uh, it talked a lot of farmers that said that like that the hemp fibers really obscured like when they combined, and so some people know like don't touch it. Has there been like mechanical advancements to combat that, or maybe genetic select or selection for that too? Yeah. So has has there been? Uh, mechanical or genetic selection for plants that are easier to combine and yeah. absolutely and that's that's one of the big things against the 5,000 pounds per acre is that the rest of them we can combine because these plants have been bred to be short to have a comparatively weaker stem. Uh, this is more of a dual purpose cultivar. It has a strong stem so you're going to require um, some heavy machinery to harvest it but you could potentially get some very high yields and that being said there have been advances in machinery as well. Notably, there's a, a big hemp flax combine, um, which can harvest the full length of the stem and all of the grain. And it can, um, depending on how you use it, you can also get a cannabinoid rich floral section after all that. So advances in both, yes, but to maximize yield, um, you, there's gonna be some give somewhere. Don't spread those rumors. No, All you got to do is cover up the shafts with PVC pipes. <laughs> the Canadians have been doing it for 15 or 20 years. 
Uh, any questions on Zoom? Okay, last chance. <laughs> So, so you have two alleles, one that has an active THC and one that has an active CB, and there's there's no alleles that recombine those. So we have the B. That, that makes sense. So we have the BD allele and then the BT allele, and they're not the same genes. So do we ever see recombination? And that gets into the nitty gritty molecular genetic stuff, which is messy. So very largely, we don't see recombination between those two genes when we look at the gene sequences. It's just kind of a mess. There's a ton of gene duplications, of rearrangements, of inversions, pseudogenes everywhere, cassettes, retrotransposons, like every word that you can think of that makes a thing difficult, you have there. So what we do is we treat it as two distinct loci that don't recombine, and we're right most of the time. Uh, yeah, there have been people who are actively studying to see how much recombination really occurs and really defining the limits of that locus uh, but by and large, we see that this um, behaves as essentially one locus. We have not seen it yet. Still looking. Okay. So I can take this. Oh. So we learned a lot from Jacob today. Uh, we thank him for that. We also learned there is hope for a former serial genomicist. So keep, keep that in mind. Uh, I forgot to mention that uh, Jacob will be staying on as a postdoc in my lab, uh, running my lab while I go on sabbatical. So uh, he will be around for a while, hopefully quite a while and uh, again, has a lot more work to finish up on. But now, for now, please join me in thanking Jacob and congratulating him. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.